I'm going to talk now to Georgia Gil, Ho- Gil Holly, who is a journalist and editor in chief at the Foundation for Uyghur Freedom. Uh, George- Georgia, are you there? Uh, hi, yeah, great to be here. Well, uh, look, I'm I'm just flabbergasted by this entire situation, right? But for people who don't understand, can you just explain what is going on here? Because I think we hear about the uh, Muslim minority in China being discriminated against, but I don't think we all fully understand it. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the Uyghur minority, most of which are Muslim, um, there's a very small Christian uh, and otherwise population there too, but most of them are uh, Muslim by faith. So they are mainly located in China's northwest province of Xinjiang. And essentially, the uh, persecution of them has already ramped up from 2016. Uh, and this involves um, forced labour camps, uh, which the Chinese government like to call re-education camps. Um, it involves quite harsh population control measures involving forced sterilization, forced abortion, uh, the forced marriage of Uyghur women to Han Chinese men, Han obviously being the uh, majority ethnicity in China. Um, it also involves some very uh, strict and repressive measures against the uh, f- expression of religion. Um, and so this is the major situation that's been going on. Uh, and this week, there has been a huge leak of documents that essentially um, they are their speeches, private speeches by uh, top members of the Communist Party in China, um, dating to around 2014. And these detail um, some of those abuses I was talking about, or rather, sorry, they they detail a need, uh, the Chinese Communist Party's perceived need for those policies and that they want to bring them in. And these are the policies that have now happened. So uh, going on from 2016 to obviously now, 2021. So they prove a uh, sort of a more intimate link between the top party leadership and these policies that are ongoing right now and how they perceive them as a way to essentially demographically destroy and culturally destroy this minority. So what we've seen really is further evidence of genocide and further evidence of the Chinese government's, um, you know, top echelons, their link to it and their want for these policies. I'll tell you what amazes me about this. Um, (laughs) The the Chinese Communist Party turns around and says their defence of this whole system is, yes, we are locking people up. Yes, we have them behind razor wire. Yes, they're not allowed to leave. Yes, these are similar to concentration camps. But in our, in our defence, all we're doing is forcibly educating them rather than forcing them to work. And you think, in what way is that the, the most important factor? I mean, what I'm angry about is the fact they've got people locked up who haven't committed a crime, whereas they're concerned about what they're doing whilst they're locked up. Yeah, absolutely. And sort of zooming out from the situation, it is, you know, it's evident to you how they judge, how they judge how they're able to treat, you know, their own citizens and sort of looking at it more closely. So they have people in forced labour camps, they have people in these so-called, you know, re-education camps. And the situation is um, in 2014, 2013, there were some um, terrorist attacks in China and these were blamed on weak separatists or Islamist separatists. We don't really know exactly what happened. That was what the government blamed it on. Um, but imagine if, say, there was a terrorist attack in Europe and we thought that it was Islamist, which that's happened many times and many times, um, you know, we've had issues with Islamist terrorism. We have huge issues with, with that um, radicalization going on right now. But we would not chuck, you know, the best part of a community into forced labour camps, into re-education camps and suppress their religion. That's not how you deal with that. And also, that I don't believe that the Chinese Com- Communist Party really believe that that's what they're doing. I think that they want to eliminate this culture because they don't want the risk of Xinjiang ever being independent, which is obviously what many people there want, um, because there's a historic sort of culture there that's very separate to the main. And it's important and it's important it's important to bear in mind what most people don't realise is that the coast of China uh, has something like ninety six percent of the population, ninety four percent of the population. So actually when you see this vast uh, Chinese state, most of it is very, very sparsely populated. And we're talking about one of these relatively sparsely populated areas, aren't we? Yeah, so this is true. However, like you're saying, a lot of economic activity and the vast, vast majority of the population for historic and geographical reasons are in the coastal areas. However, Xinjiang is an incredibly important area. It forms China's frontier zone with um, central and parts of southern Asia, which is absolutely vital to their one belt, one road um, geopolitical strategy and economic strategy um, 
going forward, which I uh, not ironically, rather sort of um, coincidentally, this was launched in 2013. The terrorist attacks happened in 2013, 2014, and they began to repress the Uyghurs more and more from because... sort of 2014 to 2016. So I really see this as them trying to crack down on this area because they know that if something you know big were to kick off there politically this would be very very bad for their economic strategy it's also a very resource rich area despite the fact that it's quite poor for agriculture and it's sort of very peripheral when you think of um the map of china it's still a very important area and i think that is a huge part of why they are um sort of committing these atrocities there because they do um they do uh commit human rights violations against almost every minority they find to be inconvenient however i believe that this really is the reason why it's ramping up in this area in particular yeah look uh, that that whole wider area is the istani areas and the the mongolian type areas and whatever and uh, and i'm waving wildly as i uh, as i describe that um so so these people are indigenous to the area and actually it's they're not dissimilar to people across the border in some of these some of these other countries in that they're they're majority muslim uh, they they're relatively oil rich um areas it's it, it's funny isn't it that when you look at what the Soviet Union did, uh, it moved a large number of Russian citizens into places like Latvia in mm -hmm. order to attempt to uh, sort of dilute the local population. And when you see what's going on with the Uyghurs and the fact that they have to marry uh, the sort of the, the more traditionally ethnic Chinese, um, it's 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 similar to that. It's about border security, isn't it? In reality, these people, because they live very close to other countries, they are culturally much more similar to those countries than they are to the people on the coast of China. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And these bordering countries, as I'm saying, they're not just sort of borders that China might have murky relations with. They're countries that China is very much um, interested in exploiting economically. You see, for example, the situation in Afghanistan, where um, Xinjiang borders, China is very interested in exploiting um, rare earth minerals from there. We've seen them make, you know, deals with the Taliban over this. And also, you know, during their talks when NATO was withdrawing from Afghanistan, China made a deal with the Taliban on the basis that they would um, arrest any Uyghur separatists or Uyghur refugees that they found, you know, within within their borders in Afghanistan. Um, I have to say, I find that absolutely extraordinary, and it just shows you mm -hmm. how how some of these uh, fundamentalist groups are such total, total hypocrites. The idea that a group of people that describe themselves as radical Muslims would uh, would com would would work with the Chinese Communist Party to prevent Muslim refugees going to an Islamic state is just bananas, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, well, look, I'm I'm worried about our general relationship with with the Chinese. You, many of you will remember when um, the Queen was rude about the Chinese government. Um, apparently, what she said, she got overheard, overheard, quote unquote, um, and she said the reason, the cause of this was that her umbrella had magnified her voice and made it more possible to be heard on camera. Obviously, she did it deliberately. But what happened was the police officer that was in charge of President Xi's visit walked up to her and said the Chinese have been very rude. And she said, oh, yes, they were very, they were very rude to the ambassador as well. Um, <laughs> but my understanding is, and I don't work in the palace, but my understanding is that the Queen was deeply, deeply unhappy with President Xi coming to the United Kingdom because of these human rights abuses. Prince Charles refused to meet him altogether. Mm -hmm. But the reason mm -hmm. he came was because George Osborne was obsessed with trade with China. Mm -hmm. and, and I suppose that's my question. Are we putting trade ahead of our principles? Well, yeah, absolutely. I think you sort of take one look at the situation. That's the conclusion that you would withdraw. So obviously you're referring to sort of the so-called golden age um, of relations with China between, um, you know, David Cameron and Osborne and Xi, who sort of ascended to the present to see around 2013. And um, there was a lot more sort of friendly language between them, despite the, uh, between two, the two governments, despite the fact that even during that time, this was prior to sort of the major crackdowns in Xinjiang. Of course, they were still committing huge and horrific human rights abuses um many protests in hong kong um many you know incidences of forced organ harvesting forced labor religious repression against various minority groups including the uyghurs so i think it's not sort of that this has arisen and we need to question it it's just that this is this is being talked about a bit more and things have got worse in Xinjiang in particular so which add also hong kong of course so we're talking a bit more about it and i think as well covid really 
shone the light on our relationship with China more than ever in the past few decades, I think. Um, so it's not necessarily that China was, you know, peachy and great back then, though I think it was definitely more open in terms of international uh, journalists, for example. I say more open, I don't mean as open as it should have been, of course, as open on the level as the UK, the US or well, what, what, other free nations. What frustrates me is the sheer dishonesty of communist China. Like, let me give you an example, right? And, and this may be... I admit, I've got no proof for what I'm about to say, but <laughs> me and n- n- neither me nor any of my mates have fallen ill with coronavirus where I live, right? Not, no one, right? I live in Windsor, in Berkshire, right? But we all were ill in December 2019, all dreadfully, coughs, colds. It was the worst, worst winter flu, quote-unquote, that we've ever had. I believe that coronavirus was around before um, we admit to it being around. But why do we believe that it only started in the January? The reason we believe it only started in the January is because that's what communist China's told us. Why do we believe <laughs> communist China? These people have a track record of sheer and consistent dishonesty. Mm, absolutely. I mean, any authoritarian regime on that level is, is of course, prone prone to even more dishonesty than any government, because obviously all governments have issues. So it's hardly surprising. And also they... You know, as as the expansionist authoritarian regime they are, they have very much a culture of face. They don't want to seem to be as if they're in the wrong domestically or on the international stage. And what you're saying, I mean, I'm also not a scientist or an expert on on viruses, but there is evidence that um, this virus was around this novel coronavirus, whatever you want to call it, was around in late 2019. So it's certainly a possibility that it could have obviously left China before then. Um, and of course, we know that um, during the time early 2020, when we knew or everyone sort of was becoming aware of the virus, China um, allowed people to fly out of the epicenter of the pandemic, um, where it initially quote unquote started in Wuhan, and fly across the world. Why would they do that if they wanted to contain it? I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah, well, I'll tell I'll tell you something that amazed me about about the whole the whole issue with how the virus came about. Now, I don't know how it came about, but remember there are three theories, right? (laughs) Theory number one, that the Chinese Communist Party had failed to ban um, meat that was from, um, that, that was wild, right? When they'd been told to do it on health grounds after SARS, right? Point number two, that the Wuhan Virology Lab did not have the levels of security that it was that the Chinese Communist Party had been told to put on it. Or point number three, that the Chinese Communist Party deliberately uh, developed a biological weapon. Now, look, it doesn't matter which of those three were the cause. Mm-hmm. There is one thing in common, the Chinese Communist Party. Mm-hmm, absolutely. And there's um, huge evidence for the lab leak theory. Obviously, it's not totally confirmed. And guess why? One of the reasons that you couldn't confirm it is because the Chinese government continually deceives and avoids proper scrutiny. They didn't allow proper examination of it by WHO officials. Unsurprising because the director general of the WHO, um, a former president of Ethiopia, he is pretty much, um, you know, funded by the Communist Party. Uh, funded by the Chinese government or he's been extensively aligned with them throughout his career. So and, it's and hardly of course, surprising. Of course, he's, he's the first he- has head of the World Health Organization who is not a medical doctor. Oh, and by the way, yeah, let's, absolutely. Uh, let's just Sorry, be clear. <laughs> let's just be clear on one, one important principle. Scientists in general do not professionally refer to themselves as doctor so they don't confuse themselves mm-hmm. with a medic. I'm afraid that Dr. Tedros, or whatever his name is, is deliberately leading people to believe that he is a medical doctor and he is not yeah that's definitely quite possible and i think of course most people um obviously we know that a physician is a different type of doctor but probably most people in passing who wouldn't know much about him or the who would probably think just assume because of his authority that he is you know a, a medical doctor which obviously he isn't and also um sort of touching on him a bit more He was um, a very controversial figure in Ethiopian politics. He was apparently responsible for a cholera outbreak um, because he wasn't managing the health system properly when he was in charge of that. He's by no means, you know, squeaky clean, even when it comes to his record um, outside of his relations with the Chinese government, which, as we were saying, are, you know, scandalous, pretty much. (laughs) Yeah, well, the the other thing, of course, um, that I always think 
I always think that we are the muggins countries. We're the idiots. In fact, I'm going to insult the listeners. The listeners are idiots <laughs> too. And I'll tell you why. Because time and time again, we fund these organisations and they get away with all sorts of things. What about the Sex for Food programme? The unofficial <laughs> title of the way UN officials um, were forcing people to give their children to them uh, in exchange for food in some of the poorest parts of the world. Now, look, at the end of the day, if the UN were not um, were willing to behave properly, they would lift the diplomatic immunity for these people so they could be criminally prosecuted. But they've not done it. And actually, what annoys me sometimes is these international organisations funded by us, but they get to do whatever they want. And frankly, the reason that Dr Tedros can get away with covering up the pandemic to start with is because Britain, America, France... Germany, Australia, pay the bill. China doesn't contribute anything to the World Health Organization compared to us. Mm -hmm, absolutely. I think this is a hangover of the fact that the UN is one of the you know major international institutions that came out of um, World War II, the idea of sort of creating these multilateral organizations to prevent war and conflict and cooperate in the future. But the problem is that as you know, as the decades went on, more and more non-democracies and authoritarian regimes join the UN and in the General Assembly they have um, an, you know, an equal vote to a democracy like the UK or the US who contribute not only are obviously morally blessed places to, to, to live for most people, um, they also contribute hugely to these budgets more than other nations. But, 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 obviously sometimes that's for economic reasons but I don't think it's justified when, when we don't call the shots as much I don't think it's fair that, um, yeah, these authoritarian regimes, um, but what we, they but, but, but what can we, infiltrate organisations like the WHO. With, but what we've with their tried to do, event. what we've tried to do over the years, we have pushed consistently the equal but different. We've basically said the reason why X country is poor is because you know the the West exploited it, all oh, its slavery and all this sort of stuff. Whereas in reality, half the time it's because of bad governance. You know, you are looking at the United Nations. The United Nations had Colonel Gaddafi on the Human Rights Commission. Colonel Gaddafi, right? And we're all sat around taking this thing seriously and i think mm -hmm. that that certainly with the world health organization we saw in the early stage of the pandemic the world health organization did nothing other than shine up the reputation of communist china who had been wholly responsible for the outbreak of the pandemic and whilst they were shining them up what was communist china doing deliberately deliberately allowing infections to take place around the world in order to avoid embarrassing president xi of china a man who has banned the image of winnie the pooh in his country on the grounds he looks a bit like Winnie the Pooh I mean how pathetic is that <laughs> absolutely I mean it speaks it speaks obviously to the vast insecurity of people uh high up in the Chinese Communist Party unfortunately um and sorry but adding on the UN point I also believe Tedro, uh, Dr Tedros of the WHO I think he actually nominated Robert Mugabe to be a UN goodwill ambassador <laughs> Yeah. So that's Although, just another blot on his record. I mean, but but it's 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 just not serious, is it? But of course, we we don't care because ultimately, all sorts of international organisation can get away with all sorts. I mean, look, I say this as a Catholic. You know, in reality, uh, the Catholic Church, because of the lack of scrutiny, I talked about this at the beginning of the mm -hmm. show, has got away with bad behaviour. I mean, they've they lost, I think, around two hundred million on a property deal in London because there was a lack of financial scrutiny, and of course, there's child abuse stuff in the past. And I just feel like time and time again with international organizations they they attract they attract people who are discredited in their own country and i'd even talk about the european union look the only way you can get onto the european commission is to have lost an election in your own country and be discredited in your own country and and, and we expect this to be a serious institution but look i want to get back to the uyghurs because that's where we started so let's let, let's end mm -hmm. there and just say you know are we are we just now despondent about this or is there any sign of hope uh, for these people? Um, gosh, um, I hate to be negative and I hope that in the future we can do more to help. Um, but the problem is that, you know, as the UK, we're very much limited in our ability and an internet to, to, to guide an international strategy. The US should be guiding the free world in that. They're not. Their strategy is totally confused they should be, um, you know... Their president is totally confused. So that's why <laughs> well, the yes, I mean, he, does, he thinks He thinks he's a turkey called Bob, right? I mean, he's just... Um, <laughs> um, although, although, although it has to be said, it has to be said, Donald Trump 
had called China out first. I mean, people used to take the mick out of him for being a for being a loony for the fact that he said the number one biggest issue was the behaviour of China. Yeah, I think um, although Trump's policy on China wasn't sort of you know uh, I don't know watertight or achieve all the aims that I would like, I think that he definitely did probably you know one of the things that people even who might not like him or vote for him um, can agree on. He sort of um, has no filter when he speaks. He's not that sort of typical politician. So I think that probably he was in a better place to criticise some of those things that that China has pursued even prior to who uh, the who scandals and the, the COVID scandals and prior to sort of the Xinjiang thing being in the news as much. Um, I think yeah, he definitely played a good role in calling that out. Um, but I think, yeah, obviously we can we can talk about Joe Biden as well. But I think that the issues with the US's relationship with China obviously predates Donald Trump, predates Biden. Um, you could even say sort of goes all the way back to, you know, maybe Richard Nixon and Kissinger sort of uh, striking that deal um, to trade with China um, without sort of prioritizing anything else than cash, basically. <laughs> um yeah, I think that if we need to have, if if we want to pursue sort of a coherent global strategy, we need, the US needs to guide a pr- an approach that is basically containment. So we don't allow China to become sort of the regional power in Asia, which would obviously allow them the springboard to become a global power uh, more so than they are now. Um, but also there's definitely more the UK can do, even as a smaller state in terms of human rights, um, you know, helping, helping exiles, um, helping protect, you know, asylum seekers who who might be fleeing, uh, journalists, um, and also, you know, outside of the government strategy, um, hopefully British journalists who are located in, in mainland China are forced, unfortunately, they're under uh, increasing restrictions, but, you know, doing their job reporting on the issue and obviously doing our best to shine a light on it. Um, and uh, like I say, in terms of policy, making sure that we're, First of all, we're not, you know, giving millions of pounds in government contracts uh, to the Chinese Chinese state companies, which we are right now, unfortunately. Um, making sure that we're not importing cotton from Xinjiang that's been, uh, you know, forcibly forcibly picked by these people who are being forced into labour. Unfortunately, we're still doing that. So we've really not done much at all. So there's definitely more we can do, though obviously the UK just doing these things isn't going to solve the issue. Um, and we can't control internal Chinese policies. I don't think that that just saying, I don't think that just shining a light on these issues is going to make them change the way they act because we've already shined shine a light on this and the Chinese government doesn't care. You know, they've been committing human rights violations extensively for decades. OK, Georgia Gil-Holly, who is a journalist and editor-in-chief at the Foundation for Uyghur Freedom. Thank you so much for that.